Okay, super. Okay, we're going to go ahead and uh, start uh, cambering this this stick. Give people a little way. bit to, to tune so, in. Yep. Yeah, they'll catch up. So we're going to go ahead and, and start cambering here. So I've um, got my stick roughed out. Um, made absolutely sure that these three bottom facets are just as clean and almost polished as could be. No tear outs. Um, so that it won't uh, crack while you're while you're bending it. Um, you got a little spot right there. I think I'm gonna smooth that out just a little bit. Okay, so one of the first things I'm going to do is see how st straight this stick is. Um, might as well get rid of some of the bends in the stick before you start to camber. This one's got a bit of a bend right here, and I use my straight edge to check and make sure exactly where that spot is. Hit it right here. So we we bend the bows using um, just dry heat, no steam, um, and we're going to heat it until it gets to like 140-ish degrees, somewhere around there. Um, basically, what you're doing is there's um, sort of this natural glue that holds the the cells together that's called lignin and you want to heat it enough for that lignin to soften and uh, it'll allow the the cells to either be stretched apart or pushed together like that so oh hey it's jason peebles let's go here one two And one of the th really important things about this is uh, people don't like to buy bows with big burn marks in them. So you have to uh, learn how to heat this without actually burning the, the uh, exterior of the stick. That's about right. Okay. And I'm just going to apply a little pressure here. Hold it for a few minutes. Does burning the stick um, affect the integrity of the bow and its ability to keep a camber? So um, burning the stick is mostly an aesthetic thing. Um, hopefully. Yeah, hopefully. It, I mean, obviously it depends on how much you burn it. Um, okay, I think we're pretty good here. Um, yeah, it just sort of destroys the aesthetics of the bow and you just want to avoid that. So, um, so I'm using a camber template. Most of my colleagues don't use a camber template. Um, this is basically um, a generic curve um, from a bunch of tort bows that I had um, access to. And um, it has proven to be, uh, to work really well. So um, uh, what I wanna do is I wanna match the curve of this bow to the curve of the of the template and so I am going to um, you can do it any way you want to start at the at the very head and work your way to the butt um, I'm sort of liking starting in the middle and working both ways so that I can let one area cool down 
and so the camber is fixed before I heat up the next sec section and lose some of that um, camber that I, that I just put in. So we'll, we'll start right here. Okay, a little mark here. I'm only heating about, oh, maybe three inches of the stick. And one of the ways that I, that helps keep from um, getting a burn mark is if you think about it, if you heat here, stop, 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 you're spending more time at the ends of your motion and that's where you can start to burn the stick. So what I do is I'm just, I've got my wrist on the table and I'm just using, swinging my hands back and forth and I'm rocking it away from the flame at the ends. It just has to be for it's just a split second. Same amount of time it would be if just if you were stopping. So this is one of the things I learned when I worked at uh, for John Ord Lee in Chicago. So let's get started here. gonna press the bow forward here hold it for a few minutes it's a little bit like um, uh, watching paint dry uh, you just got to be patient and uh, let that um, lignin uh, get re-solidified and hold that uh, camber into place. Jason said that reminds him of a French polish motion. Yeah, sort of a swinging motion, I guess it would be. So you're you're coming off of the wood at both ends of the stroke with your French polish. Braz Van Rattar wrote, Hi Rodney and Kate, are there shops or companies that sell camber templates? There are not. None that I know of. We've talked about um, putting together um, uh, a uh, selection of the different templates that I have and maybe having a booklet to go along and, and show. Um, they're, they're really handy for um, when you're um, uh, correcting the camber on an older bow. You don't necessarily use them saying, oh, I've got to make this bow like this template. But what you can do is you can use that template as a reference. How much have I moved this bow? And um, that has been very, very useful because often it's so hard to tell you heat it up and you bend the bow and it's really hard to tell sometimes how much you've moved it and sometimes you know you, you have to wait for the bow to cool down then put the frog back on the stick and tighten it up and go oh that's too much or not enough so um this is this is really handy so i've got my first bend here and um, there's about six inches or so on the template. And so I'm going to put a mark on my bow so I can put it back. And there's a mark on my template so I can put it back at the same, same spot every time. So I'm going to let that cool down a little more before we go any farther. So I'm going to put the next band towards the head here. And so what I'll do is... Um, I'll put a mark and then I'm going to heat on 
on uh, either side of that mark. Let's see what the other one says here. Brett Spillers asked, how many times can a bow be cambered without losing its strength? Um, I haven't found that there is a, a, a number. It's, I think it's pretty simple. It's, it's, it's just the lignin, which is the glue, and I think it can be softened many times. Um, I know a lot of people think, oh, you, if, you, if you overdo this, you're, you're case hardening the wood, a little bit like they do with arrows uh, when they make arrows. But I think you got to get it really, really, really hot to do that. And um, I, don't think, I don't think we'd go that far. I've made a little over 1,000 bows now. And in the process of making, I've never run into that. I have, however, run into pieces of wood that absolutely refuse to be bent, and they never become bows. So, yeah. Okay, let's hit the next one. What would cause a bow to constantly have to be recambered? Some bows just don't want to be cambered. They don't want to hold their, their shape. And I guess it would be the same as that piece of wood that doesn't want to be cambered. Um, I'm sure there's the pieces of wood that are just the opposite. Um, I have had bows that you get them cambered and basically a finished bow and you put them under tension and the, the camber just sort of falls out of the stick. And... Um, um, it's usually not a very good piece of wood anyways. Okay, that's plenty hot enough. Let's bend it some more here. Somebody did ask, um, what is an Elmar and why are you making a copy of him? And... Uh, so uh, Elmar Oliveira, a good friend of mine, a uh, really fine um, uh, uh, soloist, violin soloist. And um, he uh, lives down in Florida now, and he actually has the uh, Elmar Oliveira International Violin Competition that was um, um, conducted, I guess it was in January, before all this uh, fun started. And... Um, he has this absolutely gorgeous um, Dominic Picot uh, violin bow, and I asked him if I could make copy, a copy of that bow, and um, it was just a lot of fun. Actually had the bow right here in the shop and, and was able to um, make really detailed um, uh, drawings of it and take dimensions and, and uh, yeah, just have a lot of fun um, making, making those bows. And they do play really well. Is there a difference between a copy and a bench copy? Well, if I were doing a bench copy, if I was calling it a bench copy, I would say it is here on my bench. And um, if I were doing a bench copy, it would be like, you know, if you were trying to make a copy of, um, well, a couple friends of mine, uh, Jeff Phillips and An Anton Nedelec, um made a copy of the Jackson Strad, which Bill Sloan owns. And they copied it nick for nick and, you know, Mars and the polish and everything. And for a bow, if I were doing, I wouldn't antique it because that's just generally not done with bows. But I would try to copy the angles of the, of the knife marks or the file marks behind the head, um, whatever tool marks you might be able to find. You would try to do that, and then just a copy. And this this bow, this um, uh, Elmar copy I just did, I would just call that a copy, um, not a bench copy. Okay, next. Okay, heat that.
check and make sure it's staying straight. This is cooperating, thankfully. Okay, we moved it about an inch. So while we're waiting for that to cool, I'm going to grab something to show you here. So this is the curve for my violin bow, and this is the curve for my bass bow. And you can see how much more camber that a bass bow has in it. Okay, of course, bass bow is a little shorter. It's only about that long. Okay, so then a violin bow finished is five and a half millimeters here and eight and a half millimeters here. A bass bow, one right here, a bass bow blank cambered. Bass bow is eight and a half millimeters here and 12 millimeters here. So it is as thick as the butt of a base of a violin bow. And that's how much curve you get to put in this bow. So um, it's, um, it's a difficult chore. Uh, base wood's really hard to find and um, because you can't import it anymore. And uh, you break them every once in a while when you're making them. So uh, it's uh, disappointing when that happens. Sarah Bystrom asked, do you prefer starting the stick first or the fog and button when you're making a bow? So when I'm making, I will make the, I will rough out camber, um, put the tip on the bow, finish, not finish, but do the profile of the head, put a tip on, um, uh, and then I'll replane uh, most of the stick, just sort of cleaning it up, getting it squared up again. And, uh, and then I'll put that in my light box. So I'll get an idea what color this is going to be with the, with the color. The light box is a ultraviolet light box, which is the wavelength that, um, uh, that darkens the wood. So I'll put it in my light box for a day or so to see what color it's going to be. While that's happening, then I'm going to make my frog and my button. And that's, that's the way we're going to do it this week. Uh, Sheila Marchese asks, do you keep all the same stick dimensions for a copy? Do copies end up playing like the original, or do you have to make alterations to the stick dimensions to make the stick play the same? Every piece of wood is an individual, and um, you try really hard to find a piece of wood that, that you think is going to be similar um, to that. But I, I made um, three copies of the Elmar bow um, that were given, uh, one of them was going to be given to um, uh, the winner of the competition, and it's um, Julian Ree is the name of the winner. And um, I didn't want to uh, just have one bow that I was going to give to Ju to Julian um, and say, oh, here it is. This, this is your bow. So I made three of them, and I gave him the choice of the three. And um, uh, I can honestly say, even though I went to great lengths to try to get three pieces of wood that I thought were very close to what, the, what Elmar's bow was like, um, but I guarantee you all three of those bows play differently. So, you know, you, you wish it was that way, but um, uh, it's pretty hard to do. And it really is, the, the bow could be maybe just a half a gram difference in weight, and then where that weight distribution is will, will drastically change the way the bow plays. So it's... Uh, it's a challenge for sure.
So as you get closer to the head, it's a little easier to uh, bend the stick because it's thinner. It also gets a little scarier. <laughs> There's a lot of different methods, too, for bending the bow. Um, some people, um, you can do it like this. You can do it over the edge of the bench. You can do it against the block. I've got a curved block over here that you probably can't see. Um, I use that a lot for the base bows. Some people rub it across their leg. Um, for me, this is just a, maybe a little bit easier way to sort of feel what you're doing. I'm sure that everybody's everybody's method works for them it's just it's just what you're used to and and uh, you know you have to practice doing this a lot okay it's looking good all right we lost a little camber down here this is cool enough that we can It'll be a little hot holding on to this end, but we'll keep moving here. So there's another um, project that um, you ought to take a few minutes to look at um, it's uh, over on Facebook um, really fine young maker's name is Jake Brillhart is making a violin uh, making a violin and uh, if you go to violin hyphen building fundraiser for musical aid musician aid sorry um, you can uh, watch uh, Jacob making a violin. I just was, I saw a little bit this morning. He was uh, gluing in linings, I think. So, um, and he's going to be at that for probably three or four weeks. He's also selling raffle tickets, and they're going to raffle off the instrument when it's finished. And all the proceeds go to helping um, musicians that have lost their gigs. So yeah, go and uh, check out Jake. He's really a uh, fine young maker. Um, a couple of my friends own his violins and they're pretty pleased with him. Jake is a graduate of the um, North Bennett Street um, violin making program, North Bennett Street School in Boston. Okay, this is being a little bit more stingy here. We only got about a three quarters of an inch. So here's yeah, so a little shout out to um, all my friends at the Chicago School of Violin Making. I know you're all home right now and um, I'm sure a couple of students were working on graduation, which is gonna be delayed a little bit, but um, Wish you all well and um, looking forward to stopping in and seeing you this summer. Okay. Got to be very uh, vigilant about keeping it straight here. The last thing you want to do is have to reheat it to. Um, to uh, straighten it. So this is a couple of things you got to keep track of. Okay, keep moving here. Getting closer to the head.
Oh, it's Robert Guspa. He says, hi, Rodney and Kate. Thanks for doing this. Hey, Robert. Sorry you didn't get to come to your class. Hopefully we'll, uh, we'll get it rescheduled and maybe somebody will have actually have some money <laughs> that they can come to the classes. That's, uh, I'm really sorry this is happening to so many people. Why don't you tell everybody how um, you got started making violin bows? So my journey to become a bow maker was um, um, I started making um, uh, Appalachian Mountain dulcimers when I was in high school and thought it would be a lot of uh, fun to be a guitar maker. And I, um, uh, of course, this is long before the internet, um, just couldn't find any, um, uh, I, I knew the right way to learn was to, uh, to be an apprentice. And I just couldn't find any of those situations. And, um, so I thought, well, if I could make a violin, I could surely make a guitar, as if violins were sort of lower on the pecking order. But um, so I started writing letters to uh, violin shops asking for an apprenticeship. And I wrote a letter to um, Manning Violin Shop. And um, uh, they sent me applica an, an application to the, to the uh, Chicago School, which was then the Kenneth Warren and Son School of Violin Making, and to the um, Violin Making School of America in Salt Lake. And so I applied to both and uh, was accepted at uh, Chicago right away. And so I went to the Chicago School of Violin Making. And um, while I was in school, I was very interested in bows and started doing Rehairs and some minor repairs uh, in in the um, uh, in, at school, and um, I was hired by John Norwood Lee, who was the violin maker across the hall from Bain and Fushi, uh, and started doing uh, rehairs for him. And um, after a while, he started having me make different parts of the bows, and then finally making bows. So. I worked for him for about three and a half years and then moved out here to Ohio in 1985 and uh, set up my own shop. So, there we go. That's got it. Okay, Let's see if we're staying straight. Man, this bow is really a, a compliant child here. Sometimes Just like she. Me. <laughs> Sometimes you heat up these bows and uh, they get a little crazy on you, so. Okay, looking good. Okay, back up here by the head. Also uh, on this, this idea of where to start on a bow. If I had a bow that had a little bit of a defect in the stick, that's the place I would start cambering it because if it's gonna break because of that, you might as well get it, get it done and uh, not work your way all the way down to it and then have it break. John okay. Hess wrote, hey, greetings from France. I'm working on a couple hey. of violin frogs and it is lovely to have some company in these isolated times. Thank you. Yep, welcome to Ohio. <laughs> we had to drive out to um, Best Buy yesterday to um, pick up this um, little gizmo called a capture card so we could do this live stream with the camera. And it was pretty surreal. You get out to the shopping center there and there's just, you know, a few cars around Target and everything else is closed and you couldn't go in the Best Buy. You had to order it online and have a store pick up. And then when you got to the store, you would text them and tell them, 
where you were parked and they would come out and they were supposed to toss the bag in your trunk and you drive away with, with whatever you bought. It just seems so strange. Hoping that you actually got what you yeah. ordered. It won't be long um, if there's going to be fields planted here in Ohio. It's going to happen, you know, in the next six weeks. So farmers are going to have to get out in the fields. They're going to have to to do some things. Of course, they're that's a pretty that's, that's a pretty isolated job, thing yeah. for sure. But uh, you know, there's still seed to buy and and um, uh, you know things to do it's um, going to be interesting to see how this all works God, it looks like you're putting so much bend into <laughs> that bow it's a little scary sometimes if it doesn't break while you're doing this uh, I think your bow is pretty likely to survive the next hundred years so probably only just one bend away behind the head there. Okay, move that mark up a little bit. Tim Hulley wrote, what camber template is recommended for a viola player looking for a medium light bow? I have no idea. <laughs> um, I don't know. Um, As much as I'd like to say I can pick the bow that you want, um, it's really hard to do. Um, I would say a lot more of that's going to be um, uh, it's going to have more to do with the stature of the player, the size of the viola, their and their style. and their um, their training. Um, we have. Um, three prominent uh, viola teachers in the Cleveland area. So we have um, Robert Vernon, who plays, um, uh, who just retired actually as the um, principal viola uh, for the Cleveland Orchestra. You've got Jeff Irvine, who teaches viola at um, the um, uh, Cleveland Institute of Music. And then you've got Peter Slowick, who is the, the main teacher at Oberlin. And all three of them play different bows. Robert Vernon plays, he actually has a Nuremberger violin bow um, that's about 65 grams. It was made to have a, a tinsel wrap on it. Instead, it's got silver. And so his students tend to play on lighter bows. And then Jeff Irvine's, um, Jeff Irvine himself um, is very fond of um, English bows. And so his students tend to go in that direction. And, um, and then uh, um, Peter Slowick's students are like more of a... Um, sort of middle period um, uh, French style of uh, bow, like um, um, something more like a built on the Mare Henri Cacotte kind of bow. Um, so all three of those bows obviously are going to handle very differently. So it's, it's not an easy question to answer. Um, maybe discuss the um, can you discuss the playability aspects, maybe, of the different three major camber styles? Um, tort bows would be uh, typically uh, a more flexible bow. Um, I would say to get everything out of a tort bow that they have to offer, 
Um, you have to be a pretty skilled player. Um, you can't overplay the bow because you'll be dragging it on the string and um, it will misbehave for you. Uh, it'll tend to quiver, tend to, um, yeah, be, be less controlled. So you really, a tort bow, you have to let it do the work for you. I'm going to switch to my block here to bend this piece. And um, uh, pretty much, uh, I would say, probably even in, during Tort's time, players were always asking for bows to be stronger and a wider ribbon of hair. And I think that might be why um, Tort, um, uh, after about 1800, the, most of his bows were octagonal. Uh, instead of round and so that's a way that with the same wood the same design you can add a f uh, about three more grams of weight to a bow and you can add um, a bit more strength as well um, picot bows are going to be maybe a little bit more forgiving they've got a wider ribbon of hair they've got um, uh, a little bit more uh, a little bit more wood here in the in the lower third of the stick. Sometimes they're actually a little thicker here than here. Later bows are, and um, that um, is a bit more. Um, um, maybe a little bit easier to play for for players. And then um, for some reason, bows got a little bit more flexible. When you got into the uh, Voran bows, uh, which I don't really quite understand, and I'm sure it had more to do with the soloists of the day and the teachers of the day. Um, and then you get to Sartori, which is um, my buddy Croc coming in for an ear rub. Yep, he's liking that. Okay, buddy, got to go away now. Come on, Croc, go lay down. Lay down. Oh, yeah, Crocodile is a retired uh, racing greyhound. He um, ran how many races, Kate? 122 races, first place 12 times, second place 20. His top speed was 43 and a half miles an hour. And his name, his, his full name is Flying Crocodile. So, so anyways, back to the bows here. So then we get to Sartori, and Sartori, uh, his bows are, are very different than uh, a Tourt or a Picot. The, the heads are quite petite in comparison. They're more slender behind the head. They're more curved behind the head. The thickest point is exactly at one-third of the distance, so one-third, two-thirds. They're, they're typically uh, as much as a, a half a millimeter thicker here than they are at the butt of the stick. And so you're, you're pushing the center of mass closer to that balance point. And, um, and that part of the bow is quite stiff. Um, and I think also the bows are more likely to be a little bit, um, they're just, in, a little bit easier to control. I would say they would be, um, if you were a section player in an orchestra, you would be much more relaxed playing a Sartori bow than you would be a Tourt bow. Um, I'm sure that's not true for all players, but um, my thought about bows is that um, uh, a bow that is um, is easier to control allows you to spend less time thinking about the bow and what the bow's doing and more time to think about the music. So you can be more musical instead of having to worry about the technique all the time. So I got a little bit of extra camber down here, so I'm going to pull a little bit of that out doesn't take as much heat. Okay. Can you see that? 
that spot right there. Pretty straight. Maybe it should look this way too. Yeah, got a little bit of a. All right, I'm gonna have to straighten it out a little bit here. A lot better to do it now than to wait until you get farther along plane in the stick. down and push it over. Claire Curtis said, I love your observations on the characteristics of bows by the different makers. Is that written down anywhere? Do you know? I don't, I don't know if that's written down anywhere. Um, one thing that would be really interesting to watch while you guys are um, bored to tears is um, there's this fabulous presentation uh, done by Peter Shepard Scavit. I'm not sure I'm saying his last name right. Um, he did this um, presentation for the, Smith, for the Library of Congress uh, called the Paganini Project. And so he talks about the different bows and, uh, and, and basically his thoughts about how Paganini played certain pieces. And he even talks about that funny stance that, um, that Paganini had uh, while he was playing and sort of shows what, what you can achieve by doing that. Um, also, interestingly, he talks about how... Um, uh, Paganini played some of the concerts on one of Viome's steel bows and um, uh, he says the steel bow actually has a slightly different bounce rate which makes one of the caprices a bit easier to play so <coughs> interesting Travis Elfers wrote, hello everyone Chicago School of Violin making student tuning in all right and Tyler said, do you try to fix twists right now or correct by playing? So generally, I don't, I don't worry about the bow twisting while I'm doing this. I leave enough um, material at the butt of the stick here to um, uh, compensate for how much it might twist. However, I'll show you here in a minute, sometimes you have bows that they're either too small at the butt of the stick. You really can't allow them to do that. And um, so I'll show you here in a minute when I'm letting this rest, uh, what I do to help camber the bow. To help camber or to help yeah, to help to help keep it from twisting. Okay, Maybe one, just one more, one or two more bends at the most. So I went from my, I wish I could make a bow out of this pile the other day. Um, this bow, you can see, it's just got this really gorgeous chestnut color. Um, the head is really going to be quite beautiful. Um, the problem with it is, it has a wormhole, a big one, right here in the butt of the stick. And I can 
just barely get a finished bow out of this. I may have a little bit of a little nick there that I can fill up. So I wasn't able to, uh, I couldn't let this bow twist at all. The wood likes to twist when you're um, cameraing it. I don't know, it might be just you're, you're doing it a little bit with your hands. You're not really realizing it. But uh, they all tend to, to bend one way. So I wasn't able to allow it to bend. So what I did is I just crazy glued on a dummy frog to help me keep it aligned. Each time I bent it, I kept checking to make sure that the, the head stayed lined up with the, um, with the butt of the stick. So I might work a little bit on that this week, so you might get to see some of that. And cool down. So keep looking at my straightness here. Oh, still got to get back at this spot. Still not happy. We'll find that video of. Peter Shepherd Scabbards and share it on our Learning Trade Secrets Facebook page. There you so go. That everybody can yeah, it's really play. fascinating to watch, and he's obviously a very uh, talented player. I think he's uh, might be um, he he's involved somehow with the um, um, Royal Academy in London, I think. Sure, somebody knows can let us know if that's true. One of the projects he's working on is um, he um, tries to get a hold of um, some of uh, you know these uh, first-time soloists who played um, concertos for the first time, debuted them. There's the word. And he's trying to find um, maybe the original um, document that they used so he can find their bowings and their markings, any information he can get. And he was working on some project with um, uh, Ole Bull. And um, he had found that Ole Bull actually had bows that were extra long, maybe an inch and a half long. And um, the um, Ole Bull family still had one of the original bows, and he was able to um, uh, play with that bow, which would have been a lot of fun. So now we're gaining a, little, gaining a little camber here. We're going to have to pull a little bit more out. Dennis Braun wrote, Hola from Andalusia, Spain. Joined late because of the difference in time. Very cool seeing you from the old country. <laughs> Aren't you from the old country? <laughs> Claire wrote, Oh, great. Thank you for saying you'll put the link in the Paganini Project video on the Learning Trade Secrets page. I had actually communicated with him um, about these steel bows, and he had said in the video that he he had the use of one of the steel bows but didn't own one. And I had thought about, well, I have all these um, head and bows. Um, so head and was a fishing rod manufacturer in Ludington, Michigan, and they made fishing rods out of um, hollow steel uh, seamless tubing and um, I think this must have been in the 40s and 50s um, and um, I thought well steel bow is a steel bow maybe maybe uh, this will play um, similarly to that bow and so I 
contacted him and and was able to just I just gave it to him because they really don't have any value. And um, he actually has um, on his website he has um, um, recording of all of these uh, the sound different sounds of all of these bows um, that he's playing a particular passage with and. He has the head and bow on there, so you can go and see what that sounds like. Pretty kind of fun. All right, something's not straight here. Where are you? Okay, we're down here somewhere. That's what this is good for. You can find a little bump. And a little hollow. These little S curves are sometimes really hard to sort out and get them straight, but it's super important to do it. You get them straight, and then it points you to some other spot that needs correction too. So, better. Keep it straight. Don't let the camber come out. Good. Okay. This might be the last one. kind of tough when it gets down here. Travis Elfers asked, uh, when you are heating the bow up, can you feel the el elasticity change? And is that when you know to take it off? Or is it a visual cue? Just massive amounts of experience? Or D, all of the above? So you can't feel it change when you're heating it. What you're gonna do is you're gonna, you're, you're, you're gonna use time. And you know that after so many seconds, okay. the wood is gonna start to get up to temperature to bend. And, um, um, Croc. Yeah, he's getting bored too, guys. Um, you, 
you just you just yeah it's just going to take practice um you're also waiting for that temperature change too yeah Okay, got that. Now I got a little bit of little spot up here I need to correct. Right here. You guys are all righty, getting close here. I think we got it here. So, was that another hour? Yeah, so why don't we take another break and uh, another about a 15 minute break, and then we'll get started on um, shaping the head and putting the, the um, tip on it. So, we'll come so back about 2 30? Come back about 2 30, yeah. All right. Okay. See you then.